Wow, wow, wow. Some of you are like, yeah, yep. Some of you are like, who is this guy? Um, I, I had the privilege for uh, a number of years to be able to teach here, and then I went into male modeling. Um, it's been, it's been, a, been, a, been a pretty difficult run for me. Um, Speaking of this, I, I now live in Chicago. My son goes to this high school. We're at this theater production. He's in Footloose, and um, I, the, the play is done. I, I, I leave the play at this high school, and, and I'm, I'm walking uh, kind of like towards this hallway where all of the actors, and hopefully my son will come out in due time, and, and I'm walking, and I, I stand next to this wall, and as I'm walking towards this wall, there, there is all of these pictures of seniors, from all of the years that have gone there, and I kid you not, it was like the Spirit of the Lord led me straight to this picture right here, Landon McDonald. I, I, I had this moment where I was like, yes, Lord, that I'm gonna use that someday, and I did tell him I was gonna show that, and he, he said, I can't stand you, Steve Carter. But um, <clears throat> I'm excited to be back with you all. I love this church. I love what God's doing in it. I want to tell you, um, many, many of you might know this, but Luke, the gospel writer Luke, uh, he wrote both Luke and Acts, basically 25% of the New Testament for one person. For one person. For the most excellent Theophilus. And really, you could say that Luke was written by one man, about one man, Jesus, for one man, Theophilus. It's amazing. And, and then when you get to the book of Acts, and Acts was written by one man, Luke, about one man, Jesus, one Holy Spirit, and one growing, advancing church for one man. Now, just ask yourself this. When's the last time you have literally written out like 52 chapters for your neighbor who is far from God so that they would have with utmost certainty who Christ actually is. And it's really been humbling to me because deep down, I know so many people who are searching and exploring and seeking and cynical and basically have said no to church. I know so many people, and yet I just go on with my day. But something about Luke was like, I'm going to write him a letter. I'm going to write him a letter, and I'm going to detail. And when you read Luke and you read Acts, it really is talking about money it's talking because Theophilus is a wealthy man. He's talking about how God works with random, everyday people like you and me. And what's amazing is a number of months ago, someone came up to me and said, hey, Steve, who's your favorite person in Scripture not named Jesus? And I was like, easy, Ananias. Not the dude who stole money from church. That's a bad dude in Acts, but a different Ananias. We learn about this Ananias as Paul, who's retelling a story in Acts 22. He says, a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law. And the law was the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and highly respected by all the Jews living there. This is Paul speaking about his kind of conversion story. But if you kind of scroll back a few chapters to Acts chapter 9, you begin to kind of see this text and really, how Ananias, who this guy actually is. And truth be told, I think every single one of you in this room can be an everyday Ananias. This is this in verse 10, chapter 9, if you have a Bible, in Damascus, which is 150 miles from J-Town, from Jerusalem, from modern-day Syria, 150 miles away from Jerusalem, which is the epicenter of, like, all faith and with Yahweh, and Jesus and this whole kingdom of God movement, 150 miles away, there was a disciple named Ananias. Now, the word disciple in Hebrew is the word Talmudim. And to be a Talmudim is to be a student, an apprentice of a rabbi. And to actually be a student and an apprentice of a rabbi, you had to have high desire and high devotion to be like your rabbi. So 150 miles away, there is this Talmudim who is wanting to be like his rabbi named Jesus. This is this, the Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, 
he answered. I'm gonna stop right there because I want you to know that I believe that every single day, the spirit of the God is speaking. The question is, how many of us hear it? And I love this passage because there's this moment where God says, Ananias, and he's like, yes, Lord. Because I believe that the supernatural begins when we say yes to God's promptings and whispers. And yet for many of us, we're so distracted, so busy, so connected to our phones that we miss all of the moments that God is actually whispering and prompting to use you. And I've experienced this. I've experienced moments where I've been profoundly distracted and I have experienced moments where God whispered to me and asked me to do something that all I could say created an only God story. A number of years ago, I was in Bujumbura, Burundi. It's a real place. And I, I was there and basically we had raised all this money to give to a bunch of women because we wanted to empower women with these this microfinance bank loans to start companies that could actually bring support to their families, their communities, and their churches. The problem was we could not get three political leaders to sign off on this. So it was a little bit frustrating. So we fly to Bujumbura, Burundi. We have a meeting. It's about six of us, seven of us in this room. It's, it's led by um, a very very prominent like CEO type leader. And, and I, I flew in late that night and woke up the early the next morning, went to this conference room. I'm sit down, I got my backpack, I'm tired. And the guy's like, all right, what's the idea? What's the idea that's gonna get these three politicians to sign off so that we can bless these women who can bless this community? And none of us had an idea. We were all jet lagged. And the business leader was like, y'all are wasting my time. And so he's just basically said, you are all dismissed but you're gonna come back at dinner and you better have one good idea. I was like, all right. So I I put my backpack on, I'm walking, I look at my friend, I'm like, hey man, what are you gonna do? And he's like, I'm gonna take a nap. And I was like, ah, God does speak through dreams. That's that's biblical. (laughs) But as I'm in my hotel room, I have this prompting from God to go for a run, which obviously I don't run. And I'm like, what? So I put on some basketball shorts, I start to run. I run through Bujumbura, past these UN vehicles, and then all of a sudden I come to this this basketball court. And and there's about four or 500 people around it. I'm just standing there watching, and and I stick out because I'm the only white dude there, and I'm I'm there, and and all of a sudden a guy comes up and he he pokes me, and he goes, "Uh, you good? And I'm like, yeah, I'm all right, man. He goes, no, no, you good in basketball? And I'm like, I'm okay. And he goes, if I choose you, do we win? And I'm like, I think so, I think so. Um, And he's like, okay. Ah, you, you're out, you're in. I'm like, what in the world? I haven't even warmed up yet. And uh, I, I go, for the next 90 minutes, we go six and oh. And they come with a basket of Burundi dollars. Like, I, I didn't know I joined the Burundi Basketball Association, but I did add that to my LinkedIn account. But like, <laughs> the guy comes up to me and goes, hey, tomorrow, same time, championship game, I need you here. And I'm like, hey man, I, I'm, this is weird. Like, I'm here uh, because we raised all this money, we're trying to get it to like these, these women, but um, I got a meeting and we're trying to get like three political leaders to say yes to these finances. And he's like, what are their names? I read off the names and he goes, I'm the second guy. <laughs> I'm like, check your email, bro. He goes, I have deal for you. You win game, I take meeting. <laughs> so now I get to go back to this dinner meeting with my one good idea. <laughs> so I see here, and like all of these guys are like, well, here's what we're gonna do. It's like, we're gonna you know, show up early and like, hopefully we catch them as they, be, they walk in the back door. I'm like, terrible idea. They're like, Carter, what do you think? And I said, I know for a fact, God loves the game of basketball. <laughs> I tell this story, the guy looks at me and goes, I don't care what you need to do, you win that game. <laughs> we win the game, they take the meeting. Why do I tell you that story? Because it's so weird. <laughs> but it's an only God story. Right? It's only God's story. And here's the truth. It was just this moment of God saying, go for a run. It's just a moment where, where God says, Ananias, yes, Lord. There's a moment every single day because every moment is brimming with redemptive potential. The question is, can you see it and can you hear it? And for many of us, many of us, we are so good at making excuses. God can't use me. I don't think that must be God. And I love this moment because it's so human. 
When you read it in verse 11, it says this, the Lord told him, after he says yes, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. I love how practical God is. And Ananias is like, yes, Lord. And God's like, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go down uh, Power Road, and then I want you to make a right on Elliot, and then I want you to go down to the sand. And like, I, I'm acting like I know what I'm talking about right now, but I don't. But like, he's just so direct. But then Ananias is so human, because look at Ananias, because his mind starts going, yeah, 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 but. Yeah, 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 but he says, Lord, verse 13, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. It's like Ananias is saying, God, I know, I know you have everything in the palm and grip of your hand. I just don't think you've been watching the news. <laughs> this is a bad dude. And you want me to go talk to him? He's come here to arrest. And th this dude arrests people. He persecutes people. He's even killed some people like Steve. Um, and we learn in like Acts 7, like, well, why would you want me to go? This is going to be bad for the movement of God. And I think many of us, we do this, right? We feel a prompting maybe in our local coffee shop or the marketplace or the neighborhood or our school. We feel a prompting from the Lord, and we're like, yes, yes, yes. And then God tells us what he wants us to do. Forgive that person. Invite that person to church. Sit with that person. Engage and hear that person's story. Hold space for that person's addiction. Be with them. And we're like, yeah, 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 but. And I love what God says back. It says, but the Lord, verse 15, said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And here's the thing is, as many of us, we, we kind of have this zoom in theology. And we, just, we can just like zoom in on a label we can zoom in on a person's color of their skin. We can, we can zoom in on like where they grew up. We can zoom in on like what separates us. We, we, can, we can zoom in on what's different. We can zoom in on what we think that they'll say. We can zoom in on their past. We can zoom in on what other people will think. And here's the most profound thought I can give you today is that's not how God works. God's like Google Earth where he's like zooming out. And he's like, you don't see what I see that if my son and my spirit are at the center of this man's life, who he will become. You don't see that. What you see is what he has been. You do not see what he will be. But for him to be what I need him to be, I need you to show up. And the question is, would you go? And do you go? And in your actual one and only life, do you presently go? And I love what the scripture says, verse 17, then Ananias went. It has like Genesis 12, when Abram heard from God and it just said, Abram went. Then Ananias went. And, and you gotta see this. Is he goes to the house, he enters it, placing his hands on Saul. He says, brother, Brother Saul, not murderer, doesn't label him. He says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Here's my honest question. What if Ananias said no? What if Ananias was like, yeah, God, I see what you want to do. Just, ah, uh, it's not going to be me. Well, then God's going to have to go to somebody else. But what if they say no? And God's going to have to go to somebody else. What if they say no? And God's going to have to go to somebody else. What, what if they say no? Do you understand that, that Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament? And if Ananias doesn't show up, we might not have the theology of Romans. 
knowing how to have joy in the midst of suffering in in Philippians. We we might not know the supremacy of Christ in Colossians. We might not know how to worship like in our identity in Ephesians. We might not know about a crazy church in Corinthians. We we might not understand how to lead and mentor and develop and disciple someone like in 1 and 2 Timothy. We might not have all that if Ananias said no. And here's the truth. As I hear it, I hear from leaders, I hear from people in the pews, I hear from congregations, I hear it on podcasts. We just need more Pauls in the church. Here's the truth. You don't get more Pauls unless an Ananias shows up. And here's the truth. You are an Ananias if you let God use you. And what I've come to realize in the life of Ananias is that there are four principles to being an everyday Ananias. And if you actually adopt these, put them into your life, I'm telling you, God will give you moment after moment after moment, and it will stretch your faith. But here's the truth, here's the truth. You will become addicted to the thrill of God using you. The first principle is this, that you have to live. Live deep with Jesus. Ananias was a disciple. He was a Talmudim. He was a student. He was an apprentice of a rabbi named Jesus. He had high desire and high devotion. And if there's anything I can ask you, is I don't need you to know more facts about Jesus. I need you to be with him. I need you to want to be with him. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to know Hebrew or Greek. You just have to be someone who is willing to be with him. Do you live deep with Jesus? Number two, will you show up with expectancy? Will you show up recognizing that every space you walk into, God's already there? And if God's already there, then God actually wants to do something. Because if every moment is brimming with redemptive potential, then God actually wants to use you. And the truth is, you could walk into Starbucks, he's already there. And if he's there, how attuned are you to heaven? to the whisper's promptings, to the spirit's promptings. And do you find yourself just going, God, what do you, what do you, what do you have for me? When you show up with expectancy, God, how do you wanna use me here? Because the truth is, the truth is, you are a temple. That's what Paul will say, you are a temple, which is where heaven and earth meet. So everywhere you go, you are standing on holy ground. And people who come close to you ought to experience in reverence and beauty and joy, what it means to follow Christ. The truth is you, you, you are as close as someone might ever get to this book. And the question is, how are you embodying it? You show up with expectancy. God, are you here? Number three is you relate with everyone always. You relate with everyone always. Even Green Bay Packer fans, you relate with them. The truth is, is every person was created in the image of God. If you live deep with Jesus, you show up with expectancy, here I am, use me, and then you actually start building and chopping it up with different people of all backgrounds, all nationalities, all kind of beliefs. I'm telling you, God's gonna give you only God stories. And when you have these only God stories, I'm telling you, Your faith is just gonna expand and expand and expand. You live, you show up, you relate, and lastly, you risk it all for what matters most. You risk it all for what matters most. There's only one thing that you can take into the next reality, one thing, and that's people. Can't take your Tesla, can't take your Jeep, can't take your kicks, can't take any kind of system or software or pictures or anything that you've, the only thing that you can take into the next reality is people. And the single greatest gift you can give another human being is an introduction to the God who loves them. And I'm telling you what, and I know, I know some of you are like, Steve, you probably have the spiritual gift of evangelism. I don't have that gift. I hear that all the time. I hear it all the time. You got the gift of evangelism. You just want to tell people about Jesus. I don't have that gift. Can I just be really, really honest with you? Every spiritual gift leads people to who? 
Jesus. If you have the gift of hospitality, what is that? You create safe and secure environments for people around the greatest charcuterie board ever to experience who? <laughs> Jesus. If you have the gift of mercy, you are the hands and feet of who? Jesus, if you have the gift of administration, thanks be to God, your place in heaven is unbelievable because I do not have that gift. But administration, you bring order to the chaos so that people can experience the values and heartbeat of who? Jesus, you have the gift of leadership. Oh my goodness, thank you. That means you bring the values of heaven down here and you lead in your home and in your company and your school and in the church so people can experience who? Jesus. Every spiritual gift leads people to Jesus. I know, I know, I know, I know. Some of you are gonna say like, yeah, 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 but you, you're, you're probably an extrovert. You probably like people. I'm an introvert. Uh, here's the thing, here's the thing. My wife, a profound introvert. Me, pretty extroverted. But here's what I do. I can skim the surface and I can chop with a bunch of people. My wife can go deep with four or five people and she can go so deep and ask such pressing questions. All I'm asking is if Luke had one person, Theophilus, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, what would it look like for you to have one person? One person that you pray for, one person that you fast for, one person that you say, God, I'm telling you, I can't seem to get this person out of my mind. Give me a moment, give me an opportunity. And you know what's wild about God? He will. Because everything that makes his heart beat are people. And he's gonna run after them and not stop running. And the way that he runs after them often is by using everyday Ananias like you and me. So if we're gonna risk, risk in my home has become a little bit of an acronym. And the R is this, rescue people, rescue people, rescue people, rescue people. That's it. If you've been rescued, then you are going to rescue. Grace isn't something you just hold on to. You're like, it's not like you're the Hoover Dam with grace. And you're like, I got all the grace. I got all the grace. You, not so much. Me, all of it. <laughs> no, like we have this. We're supposed to be giving this thing away. We're supposed to be like, man, I've got it. Dallas Willard says, saints ought to burn through grace faster than sinners ever could. Because we understand we need it and so does everybody else. And we are just giving that away. But here's the truth. Is that when you actually begin to hear from God, and God prompts you to go talk to that neighbor, go talk to that classmate, go talk to that person who actually you work with, go invite someone in your family who's far from God or seeking or exploring. You are creating an opportunity for that person to say yes or no. And many of us have junior high dance trauma when we asked the girl to dance and she said no. Now in my case, just looked at me and started crying and ran out the door. <laughs> so I don't, I don't like being told no. I think for many of us, we're in the back of our mind, we're like, ah, I don't wanna hear the word no, I don't wanna hear the word no. That's why it's so much easier to go serve in like a soup kitchen, no joke, because it's not like someone ever, when you're handing them food who needs food goes, that's what you're serving me? They're usually like, thank you. But when you find yourself going to serve someone an invitation to the God who loves them, sometimes people are like, no. And I remember Mark Burnett, uh, we got the chance to interview him. He's the guy who created Survivor. And when we were interviewing him. Um, we asked him, hey, do you ever get told no when you pitch a show? And he goes, yeah, all the time. He's like, no is an acronym. All it means to me now is next opportunity. And I started to think about that. I spent so much of my life actually putting all of the onus on if that person says yes or no. And you know what I was not doing? Is not actually recognizing that every time I hear God and say yes, my faith expands. I have no control over what this person's gonna say. Now, I could be weird. I don't wanna be weird. Don't be weird. But like for the, for the heartbeat is I don't want their no to Jedi mind trick me 
from having my full attention being, if God tells me to do something, if God tells you to do something, will you do it? Here's what spiritual maturity is. You hear God, you put it into practice, like that. Spiritual immaturity is you hear God and you're like, yeah, well, what, uh, maybe not yet. And you go and sit on the sidelines. And so what we started to do it in my church in California years and years ago is we created what we called invitational fails. And oftentimes during service or small groups, we're like, hey, anyone hear from God and like go invite someone? And, and people would be like, yeah. And every time someone heard the word no, our church just started clapping. Which, which was kind of weird for people, but we were like, we're not celebrating whether people say yes or no. We're celebrating, did you hear God and actually put that into practice? So I'll never forget this guy, Tony. Tony like worked in uh, an insurance uh, kind of company and he was like, you know, doing his TPS reports or whatever. And, and, and he had been praying, he'd been praying that like he could actually lead his boss to faith. And, and so all of a sudden one day his boss came to his office and said, like, hey, Tony, what's up? And, and Tony like looked at him and he's like typing, and he's like, um, what, do you, what do you do on Sundays, boss? And he's like, I watch football. Oh, that's cool. You wanna come to church with me? And the boss was like, no. And then he just walked away. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Tony tells the story, and the whole church is like, you did it, Tony. And here's the truth. Like, I love my Chicago Cubs. Oh, we're not very good this year. I love them, though. But even the best player on our team, Dansby, I love this kid. I'll tell you, he's not hitting 400. He's not hitting 500. He's barely hitting 300, which means that 30% of the time that he's up, he doesn't get on base. The truth is, you're gonna hear God and you're gonna put it out there and you're not gonna hear 100% yes. But you have the chance to say 100% of the time, if God whispers, I'll say yes to his voice. Here's what I know will happen. The more that you say yes to the promptings of God, the more that you will have only God's stories. And here's my challenge for you, mission, is I want you to have and pray to have an only God story every seven days. Add this to your prayer each morning. God, give me an only God story. God, give me an only God story. God, if you whisper, I will say yes. One of the ways, and simple ways that a buddy of mine says it is, the answer is already yes. What's, what's the question, Lord? Who's the person, Lord? When you live with that sense of devotion and dedication, God's gonna give you these stories. And if you have an only God story every week for an entire year, that's 52 stories. You do that over five years, it's 260. You do that for 10 years, that's 520 only God stories. When you find yourself facing adversity or difficulty and your faith is like, yeah, but I've seen God work. I've seen God move. I've seen and experienced God do the unthinkable. I've seen miracles happen. This adversity is nothing in comparison to my God. And if we're really, really honest about the American church right now, we're weak in that muscle. All of a sudden, adversity comes and people are like, where am I gonna go? But can you imagine if a whole bunch of people were like, yeah, 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 I see it, I see it, I see it, but I also see what my God can do. You start praying like that, I'm telling you, it will change. And that's why, Kay, every, every movement, every revival, everything has begun when people's knees are in prayer. You gotta be praying for it. You gotta be attuned to heaven. And some of you are like, man, I liked you a long time ago. I don't like you anymore. Go back to the Midwest. I was gonna wear like a sweater and jeans and I walked out of the, <laughs> the hotel and I was like, nope, I'm not. I'm just already sweating. But I'm telling you what, man, can you just imagine if mission just started praying? When I was in college, I, uh, I was given a car it was a 1983 Ford Squire country station wagon with the woody paneling. It was amazing because you could roll three in, the, in that front seat because it was a bench. I could put four there. And then you could put four in the middle. And then right here, you could put, it made like a U and a table popped up in the back. This whole car meant I did not have a date in college. But I, I, would, I would drive this thing around and... and I mean, I would just throw people in it. 
And I remember just driving it one day and I remember God just whispered, I gave you that car. I was like, I would like another one. Um, maybe a Tacoma, a Wrangler. And he's like, no, no, I gave you that car. And, he's like, and I just felt like the Lord was talking to me. How many people can you fit in that? I don't know, 11? He's like, I want you to name the seats. I want you to start, like, actually name the seats. Give each seat a name, and I want you to pray that that person would get in that car and that you would take them to church. The most I ever got in this car was eight. I went to church. That thing was low ride It was fantastic. I used to work at Pottery Barn, and I took a Pottery Barn sticker, and I just put that right there. Right there, it said Pottery Barn. It was awesome. I become a junior high pastor. As a junior high pastor, um, I'm trying to like fire up the students. And I, 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 we have a big event that's coming in two weeks. And I have all these seats and I tell them this story about how God like just kind of spoke to me. And I just say, hey, if you, your mom drives a Toyota Corolla, that's a gift from God. You got three extra seats. Your dad drives a truck and you got two extra seats potentially. Your, your, your mom drives a soccer minivan, whatever that is. Like, you got eight extra seats. I'm sorry. You better be praying. And I, I'll tell you what, two weeks later, still one of the greatest moments I've ever had in ministry, running this junior high ministry. What I love about junior high students is, is they don't, like, make excuses. They, like, they want it. Somehow when we get older, we just don't want it. We, like, want, you know, to be safe and nice and clean and look like we're all good and have it all together, which we don't. Junior hires are like, I don't have it. And they just like go for it. I was standing outside, all these cars come out. And I'll tell you this, like 98% of all of the vehicles were just packed with junior high students. The last car that comes, no joke, is a old school station wagon. And the dad goes to the very back and opens it up. And out of the back comes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. It's not legal right now. 12, 13, 14. And then the last kid climbs out of the back and he's got a beehive going due east. And he looks at me and he goes, it's the miracle of the station wagon. And he wall rolls in. And I kid you not, this one kid was like, my dad's got a station wagon. And he started praying and he started to invite all of his friends and within six months, eight of the 15 students were give, gave their life to Christ and were baptized. Those eight students go into one of the most difficult junior highs and they're like, we are gonna start an uprising. And they start a faith uprising that ends up seeing hundreds of students come to faith. Then those hundreds of students go into one of the most difficult like high schools in, their, in, their, in Grand Rapids and they show up and they're like, let's do it again, Lord. And they do it again. Why? It's one kid with the beehive going due east was like, I could do what Ananias did. Can you? And all this starts with you wanting to live deep with Jesus, you leaving this place and showing up with expectancy. God, I know you're already here. My answer is yes. Who's the person? What's the question? And I'm gonna relate with everyone. And I'm gonna risk it all for what matters most. Because rescue people, rescue people. And I know I'm gonna be told no, but I'm gonna celebrate invitational fails because I said yes to you. And God, you are gonna give me an only God story every seven days because my knees are in prayer. And I'm telling you, you do this, this church would be filled. You do this, you're gonna have to like wait because more people just getting dunked. More people just getting dunked. You do this, schools start looking different. You do this, everything starts changing. But here's the other question. What happens when you say no? I'll tell you what happens. You say no to God's whispers and promptings and God has to go to someone else and he says no or she says no and he says no and she says no and this is what ends up happening. Families are affected. Cities are affected. Churches are affected. Counties are affected. Countries are affected. Nations are affected. 
our world is affected and heaven doesn't become what heaven was intended to be. And so mission, I left the humidity to come to an excessive heat warning to tell you this. If God whispers, may you, for the love of God, the power of the Holy Spirit and the way of Jesus, may you say yes. Amen? Amen. 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 Rachel, it's going to come up and close it out because... We won the game. We won the game. Yeah, we did. We took the meeting. We took the meeting. The great Rachel. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Isn't it so good to have him back with us, you guys? So good. I have uh, three teenagers. So we have a minivan, a truck, and a Prius. So I feel super challenged today to come back next week. Um, hopefully you guys will come back next week with your cars filled up as well. Um, I just also wanted to say, if you came here today, maybe with some heaviness on your heart and you don't wanna leave heavy, you wanna talk to somebody, you wanna pray with somebody, we have people at the base of the stage. Um, maybe that's gonna be your first yes this week, okay? So come on down for prayer to talk to somebody if you need that. And the rest of you have a wonderful week and we'll see you next Sunday with your cars loaded.